Okay. Thank you so much. We're ready to start our second presentation. Victor Portzik was going to be talking about where are genealogical records in Germany? When you find your village of origin for your patron or the patron finds it, they're gonna to wanna to go, okay, now how can I go and find these records again? Uh, Victor was born in Bremen in 1919 and he was a, his family was a resettler family that came from Upper Silesia and from the Bukovina. And as he said, these were German settlers who, who had settled in Eastern provinces and then after the Second World War. Um, he was, uh, his family were resettlers that they had come from the Eastern areas and settled in Bremen where he was born. Um, he um, got interested in history very early on and doing genealogy, and he decided to turn his hobby into his profession. He studied history and archive science, and after some years um, as a self-employed genealogist, is now working at the Bremen uh, State Archives in Bremen, and in his position, um, he has a range of um, duties uh, in it, yeah. and he has interests in sports and reading. He devotes himself to genealogy in his spare time. I don't know when you have any of that, but uh, <laughs> and is active in a number of genealogical societies. Currently, he's deputy chairman of Die Maus. Gesellschaft für Familienforschung in Bremen, which is um, a genealogical, a very famous genealogical society in Bremen, and among others, uh, among other societies. So I'll let Victor go ahead and speak. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much for this nice introduction, and thank you very much for having me here on this international conference. It's really a pleasure for me from Germany. I just go ahead and share my screen. Yes, I was asked today to talk about uh, where are genealogical records in Germany, and uh, I could do it really quick and say everywhere, but I want to uh, make it a little more interesting for you. So um, I want to get started um, by talking about the territorial aspects of Germany. Uh, Joe, uh, in the presentation this morning, uh, told about how the borders um, changed uh, over time and about the different levels of administration. So this is uh, where I'm going to start. Um, this will mainly concentrate on the public administration archives uh, from the counties, from the states, etc. And then I will turn over to other genres of archives, such as church archives, private archives, and others. And um, I will show you some portals and uh, some pages of, uh, if you know a location where your ancestor came from, you can check up um, which archive might be in charge. This is point three. Um, afterwards, I picked some uh, spotlights on genealogical sources, such as uh, vital records, uh, church records, and others. And I will just try to figure out in which archives you are most likely to find them. Um, and I will also have some spotlights on secondary sources like city directories, etc. And in the last point, I will um, talk about some special collections um, about some uh, from example from the uh, state archives on uh, soldiers of World War II or uh, victims of the Nazi persecution. I will skip this because I was introduced so kindly. So um, yeah, let's start with the uh, administrative history of Germany. What I brought here is a map from just before the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, so just about the French Revolution and you can see the area that is now Germany was uh, like hundreds of little states um, existing at that time. They went from uh, only very small villages that were independent states to very large areas such as Austria or Prussia. So you can find everything in Germany and it's even more confusing uh, even for us in Germany uh, than it is today. So um, what you can say is that from the beginning um, of the German state, you can go back uh, as far as the medieval ages, it was always a federal system. And um, the states, uh, the single states had their own interests and they were fighting against uh, each other and uh, have some um, negotiations with the, with the whole empire. This is the map today. It's more clear, I think. Um, it already started in the French Revolution that the states, the little ones, uh, were merged together uh, into bigger states, and uh, nowadays we have 16 of them. 
the smallest of them is uh, Bremen, is where I came from, just a little city uh, close to the seaside. But we uh, also have very large territories, at least for European aspects, such as Bavaria, for example. And every of these um, lands have their own archival systems. Uh, they have their state archives, for example, for Hesse, for Baden-Württemberg, etc. They all have their own um, software, uh, their own archive catalogs, and their own uh, system of uh, cataloging uh, these materials. And you won't only have it in the 16 states, you will have the same on the uh, level of uh, the federal administration, and you will have the same for the counties, for the cities, etc. Everybody is free to do uh, a solution of their own, and they do. Unfortunately, <laughs> so this uh, pyramid uh, just gives you an uh, impression of how um, the, the system in Germany is organized. I told about uh, some of these aspects. So at the very top, we have the, the Bund. So it's like the federal administration in Germany, uh, the German state. Underneath, you have the 16 uh, Bundesländer. So um, this is the 16 states of which Germany is organized. And you have uh, the special case of the three um, cities that are uh, states on their own, like Hamburg, Bremen, and uh, Berlin. I will talk about this later. And then you have the most confusing part. Uh, this is the part of the uh, counties and about the towns. So um, uh, yeah, like the municipalities, I think is uh, the English word for it. And they can organize themselves in very multiple ways. So, for example, a town or a village can have their administration of their own, or they can go together with other villages or towns and form like um, municipality associations. So, um, because they say we don't have enough money or enough people to organize, for example, our vital records, so they join together and uh, uh, make an association. This is possible, um, or they can even uh, organize themselves on the level of the counties. So um, you have all these three uh, variants and the city states as a special case because they have the state level of administration joining in with the, um, with the local level of administration. Yes, and as I said, uh, they can all have their own archival laws, their own uh, software, their own um, way to, to store the archival record in the archive. So, it starts from uh, some put it in the shelf like this, or some lay it in the shelf, and it's the same in the catalog system. And then we uh, go on and have like uh, the church archive in Germany. So uh, Joe was talking about it that uh, from the 1870s onward, uh, Germany started with um, the civil registry records, and uh, parallel the church uh, record system went on. So it, it still exists today. And we have uh, church archives of the different uh, denominations, mainly the Lutherans and the Catholics. And uh, every, uh, for example, diocese uh, can organize uh, themselves in their own way again. Uh, what we have uh, again is uh, the family and noble archives. So for example, um, important families uh, from uh, yeah, factory founders, for example, or noble families, that have a long history, sometimes keep archives of themselves. Um, this is very beautiful uh, because sometimes you have these genealogical trees there. You have a lot of um, information that uh, gives you a much more vivid uh, impression of how life was going uh, at these times. Um, but with the family archives, it's sometimes a bit um, tricky because they won't let uh, everybody in all the time. They are not public archives and they can decide uh, to whom they show the records or not. Furthermore, we have uh, archives clubs, associations, and political parties, um, and they can have uh, material as well that can be interesting for genealogists, because I think uh, most of us are not only interesting in collecting names and uh, dates, but we want to make the family history vivid, we want to connect it uh, with other trees, other people, and um, yeah, this is what, uh, what the hobby makes so interesting. Um, so, for example, sometimes the clubs or associations, they go to the state archives and ask them, can we leave our material here as a depositor and uh, make a contract so you store it for us and uh, we can decide um, who can have access to the material. Or they can make an archive of their own, but um, these are very few and only limited to the bigger ones. Furthermore, we have uh, archives of uh, enterprises such as Volkswagen and um, 
in Wolfsburg in Germany or archives of the universities and they have these uh, university matriculars, um, which can be very interesting. Take a look at um, if you have some ancestor that went to university. Right. Besides, we have um, many more <laughs> types of archives in Germany, for example, um, of social societies or of uh, tracing services, etc. So, how do I know uh, which archive might be in charge? This is, I think, the most uh, difficult question because you figured out uh, if we if you follow um, the advices Joe made before, you might have figured out the place of origin. And now you are uh, sitting there in front of your computer and say, oh, wow, uh, you've got heaps of German archives here. How do I find the right ones? I think for genealogical questions, it's the most um, important step to get in touch with the local genealogical societies. And there is some link I provided here. I hope it will open. Okay, what we see here, and I hope the mouse will work. Yeah, I got it. Um, it's a list, it's actually a, an association of all German genealogical societies we have here. And this association is again associated in the IGGP. So um, they have a list here of all the local uh, German genealogical societies, which are 73 at the moment. And you can browse here. If you know the historical territory or the zip code, you might find uh, the right uh, genealogical society here. And um, yeah, you might get, want to get in contact with them because they know best which archive is in charge for which records. You should definitely do that. I have um, put the link in uh, the presentation and um, you will get it. And so uh, sometimes more archives are in charge. For example, for the municipality, I will talk about this later. They will have some records, for example, for um, uh, village in Württemberg and uh, the state level might have as well. Um, we will see which records are stored where. Perfect. Uh, what we have uh, more is our uh, national and European web portals where different types of archives um, join together and they kind of make a copy of their material. Okay, and uh, what is nice here is that you will have um, the archive catalog from the different archive catalogs and the different uh, overlays, you will have them all in one portal. Problem is that it's, uh, it's not uh, automatically um, uh, refreshed. So um, every some months, the archives will have to send copies of their catalog, for example, to the European web portal. And uh, you will have the information here with a link to the original one. Yeah, right. Um, well, this is on national and European level. Um, maybe we can show it now. I will just try. So this is an example for um, the uh, national web portal. It's called Archive Portal D. And when you agree, you can, for example, search for location. And you will get a list of records for the single location. And if you want to uh, see which archives are in charge, you can select the federal state of Germany. For example, uh, we go to Bremen and you can show all the archives that are existing here. And you can limit your uh, research, for example, to state archives, local archives, et cetera. That might be kind of interesting. If you do this, you will get a list of archives in this particular area. And just let me show you limit it to state and local archives. For example, the only two uh, we have in the federal state of Bremen would be um, our archive, the state archive, and uh, Bremerhaven. Uh, yeah, you can see uh, how difficult it might be. They have their own city archive. Um, yeah, what we also saw in Joe's presentation is the web page of Comgen, so this uh, German genealogical um, computer association. And they also have a great list um, where they tell you which archive has genealogical records in Germany. Um, yeah, and what we do have as well, I think uh, Joe could uh, tell even more about it, uh, is that German archives join together with um, some genealogical service providers and they scan uh, sources for them and put them on, a, on a, an online database with the index material. Okay. So, 
Let me turn over and uh, start talking about the primary sources um, of genealogy. What I understand by primary sources are mainly vital records, whether they are um, organized in the church or in the civil registry office. Doesn't matter at first, but I want to start with the civil registry offices and then we go on to the civil, uh, to the church records and so on. So Joe mainly talked about it. Um, this uh, due to the Napoleonic um, uh, expansion in Europe, um, the civil records were also brought to Germany starting in 1798 and on the left bank of the Rhine River, where a lot of emigrants, I think, came from, from the Palatinate, for example. And um, later, France uh, conquered or um, yeah, conquered larger areas, for example, the North Sea shore of Germany, or at least uh, established states that were kind of dependent from France and took over their, um, their civil registry system. So um, by the time of 1813, a lot of areas of uh, nowadays Germany started uh, with this um, civil registry records, as did the Polish. Uh, um, Duchy of Warsaw as well, for example. And um, after Napoleon was defeated in 1814, most of the states decided, okay, that's not ours, let's go back and stick to the church records again. Only on the left bank of the River Rhine and in some cities such as uh, Lübeck and Bremen, they uh, thought, well, that's a good idea. We have here the civil records where we have our Jewish, Lutheran and Catholic uh, people all inside of them. So they continue with this process. And uh, I've brought you some example from, uh, from the civil registry of uh, Bremen in 1842, uh, and you will have much more detailed information in it than you will have in most of the church records of this time. So we will have uh, their occupation, for example, of the parents, the age of the parents, and um, really the, the exact date of birth, for example, and sometimes the location where they lived. So this might be a much richer source as the shirt records, but the best you can do is join these two uh, sources together. Right. So um, in the rest of Germany, after the unification uh, in 1871, they thought, okay, this idea is not too bad. So um, let's uh, introduce it again, actually. So you have to keep in mind that in some areas we have um, civil registry records from 1811, for example, to 1814 for three years, then it's abolished again. And uh, some decades later, they decided to, to introduce it again. So Joe said, yeah, in 1874, they started in Prussia, uh, short after um, the Baden areas. And um, by the 1st January of 1876, these records were introduced in the whole German Empire. So um, this is what we have here. There were some uh, important amendments made into the civil registry law, which uh, also led to um, changing formulas. Okay, this might sound a little boring at the beginning, but uh, it's very interesting for the genealogy. For example, a marriage record started um, in the 19th century would contain information about parents uh, of the bride, for example, and about um, yeah uh, the, the status, the occupation, etc. And in 1920, when Germany became the first uh, had the first democracy, they decided okay, it's not okay uh, to list um, uh, information about uh, the religious denomination, for example, or about the parents, and they just linked the number of the birth record of the bride and uh, of the spouses. Yeah, so this is very important. And um, the next important change, which I actually missed here, uh, is under the Nazi uh, time. So they just wanted to make sure everybody is German. So uh, what they did is they, uh, from this one page formula, they made a four page formula and they included information about the parents, but not only the names as before, but where they were born, what record number is the birth record of the father, what record number is the marriage record of the parents, of both spouses, etc., and so you can track back the family history much further by just taking a look at this one marriage formula. And they also have a special rubric listing all the children of uh, these uh, couples. And this one was uh, abolished as late uh, uh, as abolished as late as 1958, actually. So they kept the formula, but they didn't uh, enter anymore the information about okay, this couple is German or not, of course. Right. And in uh, 2009, they started to make it all digital. So we don't have paper records anymore. After this time, 
Uh, we only have digital records and what they did as well. And this is the very important thing for us genealogists. They decided to bring the old, um, uh, civil, the old vital records to the archives. So until 2009, they were all stored in the civil registry office. And today, which I will show uh, now, uh, they are kept in the archives after certain years. Right. What you see here is the formula of a death record from 1965. So um, especially interesting might be the bottom area where you have uh, further information about uh, the birth record, for example, or the marriage of the person. And since about the 1930s, these records are typewritten, so you can uh, probably go ahead and understand uh, most of it before, the, of course, everything was handwritten. Right. Um, there are certain uh, certain years and they need to have passed until the records get to the archives. So for birth records, this is, uh, of course, due to data protection, we want to protect um, uh, that prevent that someone goes to the archives and says, I, I want to know who the parents of my neighbors are. And this is very strict in Germany. So <laughs> after 110 years of the birth, we say, okay, this person is probably not alive. So um, the records go to the archives. And uh, yeah, if someone is alive, okay, that's it. <laughs> and it's the same as the marriage and the death. So um, we also protect the death. And uh, 30 years after the uh, death of a person, these records go to the archives. And um, right, they are normally stored, and this is uh, the most important fact here, normally stored at the lowest level of administration. As I said before, this can be the towns or the you know, municipality associations or the counties. Um, and what we have in Germany is that we always make a copy of these records. And there's also, all, uh, all the time there are two series, and the second series they go to the state archives. So for example, to the archives of the federal states. And they might not be so interesting because you, uh, in the primary uh, records, you um, most often will find some um, annotations. For example, when a spouse died or something, or where the child was born, and you won't uh, normally find this in the copies. But it might be of some help. Right. Um, in some states, we uh, even have special archives just for the cycle records. And this is the North Rhine Westphalia and in Hesse. I've linked these here, but I um, won't open them now. Um, right. And uh, furthermore, Joe talked about that the boundaries were changing very often, then uh, that large areas of uh, former Germany now belong, for example, to Poland or Russia. And he also said uh, that uh, sometimes the Germans took the records with them. And if they did so, they can be found in the archives of the federal state of Berlin because they were all bought, brought together in Berlin. And now after these um, years, uh, they come to the local uh, federal archives there. And most of them are made accessible via Ancestry. So they are scanned and indexed and put online in Ancestry. So you can go ahead and search. Um, but you should be aware that um, there are a lot of gaps in them and that most of the, uh, of the civil records are stored in the Polish or Russian archives, actually, or in most cases um, might be even lost, right? Okay, let's go ahead uh, to the time prior to the civil, uh, to the vital records, um, to the civil vital records. And this is uh, where we have the church records. So as I said, they still continue until today. And it might be very interesting to uh, combine these two sources together. Um, for both um, large uh, religious denominations in Germany, which are Catholic and Lutherans, we have uh, web portals where the archives started scanning and indexing their records. So uh, we have Matricula for the Catholic archives and we have Archeon for the uh, Protestant ones. Some Catholic archives, don't ask me why, they decided to go on Archeon, but uh, this is a very special case. Um, so uh, I refuse uh, opening these links, so you can do it at home. Yeah, I'm sorry, it would be nice to see the map, for example. Uh, in particular, you have a, a combined uh, access um, possibility, so you can enter uh, in the search block uh, the name um, of, the, of the church you're looking for, or you can go uh, approaching um, by a map. So they have a map with all these uh, church records on it and you can zoom in and uh, find, for example, if you know uh, the place of origin, but you don't know which church uh, was in charge, you can take a look around and um, see if you can find it. Right. Um, 
minor denominations uh, have sometimes archives of their own. So we have, for example, um, the Reformed Church in Germany or Baptists or um, a lot of a whole bunch of other um, denominations. And there is a list on the internet which is linked here and they show um, the uh, archives of this little uh, German religious denomination. Germany wouldn't be Germany if there wouldn't be a special case again. And uh, so in some territories, especially the large North German area that belonged to Prussia, um, church books were concentrated in the civil archives of the federal states in the 1920s and 1930s. And they just went to the uh, parishes and said, okay, we take your books now. And they, uh, they started um, uh, focusing them in the state archives. Not every federal state joined in in this action, but uh, you should be aware that sometimes uh, when you look for a church record before the 1920s, 1930s, it might be worth uh, also taking a look in the federal archives. Right. Uh, Jewish records are uh, very rarely today in Germany, and I've linked um, uh, this town. Uh, how did you call them? Uh, so they, they have a database of uh, Jewish families in Germany put online in Comcan. And this might be uh, the best way to uh, do your research um, in Jewish families. They have the source of link for every family data set uh, in there. And they could mainly be found in the state archives or if they still exist in the archives of the local Jewish communities. But a lot of them are uh, destroyed actually. Right. Um, Again, there's a central archive um, storing also information about the former German territories, and this is the central um, uh, Evang Evangelische Zentralarchiv in Berlin, uh, so the central um, Protestant archive. And uh, yeah, as Joe said, you can, for example, locate a parish sheet using Kartenmeister or Meyer's Gazetteer, and then go ahead uh, to this archive and uh, take a look if you find some sources. Right. Just some spotlight on secondary sources. So as you probably know, nearly every record can contain uh, information that might be interesting for genealogy. And uh, for example, here we have uh, the pedigree and family books. So in Germany, it's Familienregister, Familienbücher. You won't have it in every area of Germany, but especially in, uh, especially in the Southwest where a lot of immigrants came from, you will have those, for example, in Württemberg and Baden. And you will, for example, also have those in our city of Bremen. So you can uh, expect not to find only a birth record, for example, but a whole family sheet and all the information about the marriage and the children can be found on one side. And this is kind of a great source. Uh, in some areas, um, this was, uh, you were not, uh, now I'm looking for the word, you were not supposed to, to uh, do these entries, so um, it was a voluntary, so you have to pay for it. And only the rich families, for example, in Bremen uh, could afford making these records because it was very expensive. We had some villages around Bremen that belonged to the state, and they're only, for example, the miller or the keeper of the inn. They did these records, and you get the impression that there were not farmers at all, so uh, this is not right. <laughs> But yeah, right. So I've linked uh, two examples here. Um, you can go ahead and, uh, for example, we in Bremen, we will, uh, are working on putting, putting them online this month, uh, hopefully. But I don't know, uh, since I'm in the States for one week, I don't know if this happened already. Right. Here you go with the most interesting, I think, a secondary source uh, from Germany. And uh, those are the Einwohner Melder in Pilar. Uh, I tried to translate it in English, but I don't know if the word really hits the point. It's inhabitant documents. Um, so beginning from the 19th century, um, the German federal states wanted to know everything about their inhabitants. Uh, they really tried to uh, collect as much data as they could. And they put it at first in, um, in these uh, family books and in inhabitant books. And later they turned on card files. And from the 70s, now it's a digital system. And what you see here in this example is uh, a vast amount of information about a single family. You get like uh, names, you get date of birth, you get the parents, you get information about the marriage, you get information about when they move to a certain city and from where. And at the bottom, you will have a list of addresses if they change uh, their, their home in a, uh, inside of the city, they will have the whole list. You will have the children, you might even have um, information about the taxes they paid, 
or about the passport numbers, um, about the religious denominations, like everything on this card. And because you have everything on it, it's mostly under data protection. <laughs> That's what I never. So uh, you will have to write to these archives and you will get access if, for example, this is your direct ancestor on the card, or it's even you. And um, for all other cases, you will have to write a, a yeah, kind of letter why you really need this for your research. And in some cases, I think you have a good chance. Right. Right, testament books would be the next step. So this is something, if you already know uh, the vivid details about your ancestors, this might be a really great source to shed some more light on the family. Because uh, here you will have, a, for example, a testimony um, which spreads among, uh, along uh, numerous pages and you will have everything in there. So you will have, uh, for example, a person giving a shelf to her niece, for example, and you will have a whole family network written down in these uh, testimonies. And it will also show you uh, a lot of, about the living conditions at this time. So what did the persons own at this time at a certain um, level of income, for example, and uh, how did they distribute um, uh, these uh, belongings uh, to their nieces, nephews, children, etc. Right. And I think you will have those, um, they were kept in the, uh, the local authorities, you will have those for nearly all Germany. Excuse me. Yeah. Who would you write to for these? The, just the local? Yeah. <clears throat> I have it. Uh, right. I have it at the top. So you will have to find the archives of the local municipality. And uh, this is where they are kept because um, yeah, they were kept in the courts originally, and then uh, the courts gave it to the local archives. This is a category I call personal documents, and this can contain all types of data. What we see here is a denazification file from Germany. So after the Second World War, everybody has to fill this form, for example, at the American occupation zone, stating in which Nazi organization they were in, etc. And um, they were persecuted or not, um, according to, uh, to what is stated there and uh, what the witnesses said. So you will have this for almost every person in Western Germany uh, after World War II. And um, this will also give you a lot of uh, material of uh, how active, for example, a person was in Nazi time, but you will also have uh, genealogical information in here. And uh, right, we will have the same, uh, for example, also for, uh, for victims of Nazi persecution that uh, were paid some kind of recompensation after World War II. And they will also have a lot of um, biography in this. So they uh, write letters of where they were, how they were prosecuted, where they were imprisoned, etc. So this might be very interesting um, for this side as well. Right. And you, of course, you don't have uh, this personal records not only for the Nazi time, but for example, for employees of the state or uh, similar uh, categories of person, you will have them there. Yeah. These uh, Nazi personal files, as I call them, are mainly kept in the state archives of the federal states. And uh, the other personal uh, documents can be spread among all kinds of archives. For example, a person working at Volkswagen, uh, they might have a file in the Volkswagen archives in uh, Wolfsburg. Right. Those are uh, land registers, another great secondary uh, source for genealogy. And um, because this um, might contain information about um, how a certain uh, portion of land was passed on in or outside the family. When did the family buy land? How much land was this? Um, why, uh, what was the reason to pass it on? So, it's, for example, um, was, a, was there a contract made or um, was it a testimony, etc.? Right. And they are mostly stored in the archives of uh, the federal states but most of the younger ones are still in the uh, authorities, not in the archives yet. This is an example of, of me here. Right. Good, passenger lists. <laughs> this might be very interesting for you, for, uh, I guess. So we had, as uh, most of you might probably know, uh, two big immigration ports in Germany that were Hamburg and Berlin. And we have a very uh, different um, situation there. So in Hamburg, most, um, most uh, passenger lists still uh, remain, so they are kept in the local archives and they are indexed and scanned and put online on Ancestry, but this is a great source um, searching your, your ancestors, for example. 
And we in the Brahmin archives get heaps of requests. Oh, I'm looking for my ancestor that migrated from Brahmin. I know this because I have the other side from the United States, from uh, Brazil or anywhere. Can you help me find out um, uh, the departure records? And actually, in most cases, we have to say no, because uh, the Brahmin authorities decided um, at some point around 1910 to destroy all older records. And the reason was just they didn't have space to store it. It's really pity. And um, so only few records remained from the time before 1920, and they are mostly not stored in the archives of the state in Bremen, but of the um, uh, Chamber of Commerce, because they were um, in charge of organizing all these uh, immigration. Um, all the data we have until uh, 1939 uh, is in this um, immigration database, which you can find on passengerlist.com or, or uh, passagierlisten.de. And if you don't find your ancestor there, we probably won't have any records left uh, for this time. Situation is different after 1945, so um, we will have all the immigration records after the Second World War, for example, also in Bremen. Those are, uh, yeah, like this room full of card files uh, that we have there. And uh, I will show you later on one special archives uh, what might be the best way to access them. Right, so um, I'm finished now with the secondary sources and I just tried, uh, I just thought that it might be of interest for you to show some special archives, uh, some special collections for genealogy in Germany. And the first one to start with would be the Zentralstelle für Genealogie, which is located in Leipzig and which has a kind of interesting history. It was founded in 1904 and it changed their name, location several times. And um, after World War II, this is a place where a lot of church books, for example, from the former German settlements in Eastern Europe uh, and nowadays Poland were collected and uh, they are stored all now in, in Leipzig. Um, Family Search did uh, some uh, project with them and they put a lot of these files online, but not all. And the other ones uh, can only be accessed by a microfilm in Leipzig. And I've asked them some weeks ago, um, they don't know when they will put it online or scan these microphones. And um, what they also have is uh, this Anstammkartei des Deutschen Volkes. This is something from the starting in the 1920s and continuing in Nazi times. So they had the idea uh, that everybody should trace all their ancestors back. And you have a really huge database in these times uh, based on card files um, where everybody can go and see, okay, these are my ancestors and how I am connected with another person. Right, let's turn to the Bundesarchiv. So that's the uh, archive of the federal states. They were not found before the 1920s. And um, you have very uh, interesting material here. And I just picked up uh, some of uh, the most interesting ones for genealogy. And um, the links to the fonts uh, are in the presentation. And what I brought for you here is a card file of a German resettler from Eastern Europe. So during the, the World War II, a lot of German settlements, for example, in the Ukraine or in Eastern Poland, they were uh, abolished and the people were taken uh, to Western Germany at these times. Here's a resettler file from a person uh, from Romania, for example, and you will have uh, pretty much the same as on the inhabitant card files, a uh, uh, huge amount of information about uh, family, marriage, children, and here you will also, for example, have um, questions about knowledge, uh, you can grow plants, you can uh, work with cattle, etc. It's all on these card files. And uh, yeah, not only for resettlers, but you will also have it uh, for uh, soldiers of World War II, is those uh, vast uh, Deutsche Dienststelle, so you if you want to know uh, if your ancestor or somebody's ancestor was in World War II, you can go and write them, but um, keep in mind that it will take them more than a year normally to answer your request. This is a really long time. And you will also have uh, records, for example, of members of the SS, SA, et cetera, here. Right, for the time after World War II, um, the Bundesarchiv Bayreuth uh, has a very interesting material about the flight and expulsion of Germans from uh, nowadays Poland and Russia. So, for example, they were recompensated uh, for the loss, not by the Polish state, but by the Western uh, German state. 
and you will have these records where they make statements of what they lost, uh, where they have witnesses, um, etc. here. And you will also have um, records of tracing services of the Red Cross, for example, if uh, people uh, were looking for their relatives, uh, you will have it here in the Bundesarchiv in Bayreuth. Right. This uh, is the website of the Martin Opitz Bibliothek, and uh, it's kind of a complementary source for the Bayreuth archives because here, um, yes, yeah, societies of the uh, expellees from the eastern provinces organize their archives, for example, and you will also have archives of genealogical societies here, for example, of uh, the Argov Arbeitsgemeinschaft Ostdeutscher Familienforscher. This is the Eastern German Genealogical Association. And besides, it has a large library and archives uh, with records um, of themselves, mainly focusing on Eastern Europe. Yeah, last but not least, I want to introduce to you, I bet a lot of you know it, uh, the archives of the IPS in Bad Arbeiten. Uh, IPS is the International Tracing Services, a service that was, um, yeah, brought to life after World War II and is especially important uh, for victims of World War II if they if you're looking for relatives um, that were prisoners of concentration camps, etc. You would my uh, yeah you should go there and um, search in the online database. And what is a very special case here is that they are not bound to German archive law. So data protection is much lower than in the normal German archives. They also have copies uh, from records of the other German archives, and sometimes you will find the information here, but you won't be able to access it uh, in the archives where the original records are stored. Um, this is, uh, of course, um, mainly for the victims of Nazi persecution, but you will also have many Germans, uh, many yeah, Germans that left Germany uh, finding new perspectives after World War II, for example. In a lot of cases through South America, uh, you will find them here as well. Right, and they, uh, as I said, they have an extensive online archive and they are really, really good in scanning all these records. And uh, as I wrote there, they have uh, by now uh, 7.5 million records um, for persons there. Would that also include uh, persons that were involved in Operation Paperclip? Sorry, what's this? In Operation Paperclip, the people that left after 1945? Yeah, yeah. I probably think so, yeah. Would that include them? Yeah. And uh, what, what is not included are um, a lot of uh, victims from the territories that were occupied uh, by the Soviets uh, after uh, World War II. So, for example, um, Eastern Germany and Poland regions, um, the persons were living there. You might not find them there because these information in the IPS are mainly based on information that they got from the displaced persons in the Western occupation zones. Right, this would be my last collection I would like to introduce. So. I will be finished. Uh, I hope you, uh, yeah, you heard something new and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure for me. One question, where would you look for uh, Hessian soldier records when they left or when they conscripted in Germany? They would be from like Hassel area. Yeah, I would, I'm not a specialist on Hesse, but uh, we have this for Bremen. Uh, it's on the federal state level. So uh, you might uh, start by uh, writing to the Hesse Federal State Archives. And for example, we have these conscription lists uh, for soldiers in our archives in Bremen. Yeah, might be this, should be the same in Hesse. I have a question. Yeah. You mentioned the Soviet occupation in the Eastern. Did the split of Germany for those 40 years have an effect on the archives or how things were kept or anything like that? Yeah, it had. So in the Eastern part, it was much more centralized. They started by uh, implementing a centralized system for all the territory and then the western areas, as I said in the beginning, everybody was allowed to do the same. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was uh, much easier to access um, the records for, uh, yeah, I don't know, English Democratic Republic of Germany at this time, but um, actually uh, most of these records from this time are not yet in the archives, so you won't see these organizational effects. Okay, you so all the stuff is still... Out. Right. You only see it in the archive catalog system, for example. Yeah. Did you say that North Rhine, Westphalia, and Hesse have special archives? Right. What kind of special archives? They have special archives on vital records. 
a vital record. Yeah, they have several true. vital record archives. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that the civil, the copy of the civil registers went to the state archive, but the local copy stayed at the local level. For the cities like Bremen, Hamburg, and Berlin, did they all old copies end up at the same place? Yeah. Or do they also have separate archives for these full sets? <laughs> yeah, they, 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 yes, they're a really good question. So the federal archives are uh, in these uh, three uh, cities, they are in charge for both kinds of records, primary and secondary. And they will all be in the federal archives, but they are stored in different buildings. So in case there's something happens, uh, war or something, not everything is lost. This is the reason behind. So we have a building at the other side of the city, and you know, this stuff is stored. <laughs> yes. I had ancestors who came from a small municipality, and I, my understanding is that they're not a principality. I mean, it, that they're not releasing the records that they're holding on to them. Um, the principalities um, uh, were incorporated in the, in the larger states afterwards. So, so they, it would be in Hessen. It would probably in the Hesse, be in the Hesse archive. Only the, the family records of the noble families they were kept in the in the archives of the family. So, <laughs> so their family would be local, yes. but the peasants that we all come from would be <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> 